Hello, my name is Farron Glanfield. I'm the Church of Ireland Bishop of Kilmore, Elfin and Arda. COVID-19 is on the rise again in Ireland and that is alarming. And we've been asked by the government to close our churches for Sunday worship. And I know that's disheartening to so many of our people. During the first lockdown, which lasted for nearly three months, uh, we used online services to great effect. And so at this time, uh, we have asked our parishes to go online. Many of them are doing that. And the diocese itself will be conducting services online. And so the series of services, which I hope you will enjoy, uh, will be compilations of live streams that took place when we were able to go to church in uh, the summer months uh, and also taken by clergy and uh, lay people uh, in their own churches uh, at this time when we're closed. At a time like this we need to keep our eyes fixed upon the Lord. In the Psalms we read, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And so we pray for ourselves and we pray for the needs of our community and our country and the world at this time. In the strong name of Jesus. God bless. Well, hello and welcome to our Harvest uh, Worship Service for 2020. Um, uh, Harvest is the time where we say thank you to God for his creation for his provision and particularly for uh, the produce of the land so we thought it would make sense today to come out uh, into the farmland so I've got a few friends here behind me who hopefully um, will behave as we worship God but uh, it's great to be out in the beauty of creation so wherever you're tuning in from uh, we're delighted that you're here uh, and we're delighted that you are going to worship with us this morning.
as we come together, we're going to say sorry to God together. And we're going to think in our confession today, particularly about how sometimes we don't look after the world that we live in very well. We use the words beginning, Lord God. Lord God, you have made a wonderful and beautiful world. We thank you that we can enjoy the world, but sometimes we take your world for granted, and sometimes we even do things that damage the environment. We throw away things that are good and that could be used again, or we cause damage in some other way. Lord God, we are sorry when we have been like this, and we ask your forgiveness. Lord God, help us to take care of your world from now on. Amen. Now our reading today comes from the book of Psalms. It's Psalm 126 and the words will appear on the screen in front of you. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the provision of your Son and the provision of your Word in the Bible. And as we read it and learn from it today, we pray that you would refresh us and give us thankful hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now harvest, as we've been saying, is a time when we give thanks to God for his provision. Uh, mainly his provision from the land, the produce of the land. And in farming communities like these, it's not hard to see how we rely on God to grow the crop, uh, to grow the grass, uh, to form the calf in the womb. Now, the farmer, of course, uh, more than plays his or her part. Uh, farming is hard toil, isn't it? In all kinds of weather, all year round. Now, in biblical times, before modern machinery was about, it was even harder, I'd imagine. Ploughing the field, planting and watering the seed was hard labour. And then, as now, comes the waiting game. We wait, don't we, for the harvest, and we trust that God will grow the seed. And though we can somewhat time a calving season these days, we still need to wait. We still need to trust God as the cow carries and delivers the calf. And so we plant and we water and we wait, so to speak, but we know by and large that the seed will grow and that the calf will arrive. Now why? Because that's what happened last year and the year before and almost every year. Because the harvest came in the past, we can expect it to come again, however small or large that harvest may be. In saying that, we also live with a degree of uncertainty, don't we? Though the seasons change as we expect roughly, we can't be 100% sure that the weather will be favourable for us. We live with uncertainty about the health of the cows and the calves. We can't be certain of getting a good price for the milk or for the beef. And outside factors further our uncertainty. How will Brexit affect things? How will Covid affect things in the future? In this world, there's much uncertainty. You've got to feel for some of our students, our Leaving Cert students at the moment. They face uncertainty now about results, college places, social lives, future work. And though we always live with uncertainty in this life, it seems very obvious in this world at the moment. And with that uncertainty, many are suffering from worry or a lostness, a sense of purposelessness or even a paralyzing kind of boredom. So we look back, don't we? We look to life before COVID and remember being able to freely go into shops and hotels without worrying about being muzzled uh, by masks. We remember being able to freely go in and out of the nursing homes and hospitals to loved ones. We remember being able to travel far and wide without worry. We remember when we could operate our businesses and sports clubs and whatever else without so many restrictions. We remember simple things like being able to give a handshake or a hug. So we look back with fondness and we look forward with longing to the day when we can do those things again. So at the moment we might feel a bit like that Steeler's Wheel song, stuck in the middle. And yet as Christians we should be stuck in the middle with joy in our hearts and as agents of God's joy to the world. In Psalm 126 we get the impression that the people of Israel were at a point where they were living stuck in the middle. And yet joy is the main theme of this psalm. In the first three verses we see that joy as they look back at a time when God had delivered them from difficulty. They remember God bringing them through tough times and restoring them safely 
to the other side. This is what it says in verses 1 to 3. When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, some translations say, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. It was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are filled with joy. Now many people today look on trials and difficult times as kind of interruptions to the pleasures and joys of life. But as Christians, we're to look on tough experiences in a different way because we're told in the Bible that God uses trials to strengthen us. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5 that we can look at suffering in a more positive light because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Now that's not to say, of course, that we should be enjoying suffering or belittling the suffering of others, but that we can have hope in the knowledge that God will bring us through and we will be stronger and more mature for it. And Psalm 126 gives us the impression that the Israelites had been through great suffering. But that just meant that when God did deliver them, there was joy all the more. The harder the labor for the farmer, the greater the joy at the harvest. The pain of labor in childbirth only makes the arrival of a child an even more joyous occasion. So as Christians, we don't seek out or celebrate suffering, but when it inevitably comes our way, and it will, we trust God to bring us through and strengthen us in the process. As the psalmist looks back at God bringing Israel through hard times, he's looking at a very familiar pattern. God always delivers his people. In Exodus, one minute the Israelites were slaves being brutally worked in Egypt. The next they're on the far side of the Red Sea, praising God for delivering them to freedom. God didn't allow Pharaoh crush them completely. When Jonah was swallowed by the fish, God didn't allow him get digested, but delivered him onto the shore. When Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego uh, were thrown into the fiery furnace, God didn't allow the flames burn them up, but he delivered them, scorch free. When Daniel was thrown into the den, God didn't allow the lions devour him, but delivered him with no teeth marks at all. So the psalmist recognizes that God had done great things for them. So for Israel, the memory of songs and joy and laughter in the past due to God's restoring his people, bred a sure hope in them that he would do it again. And so in verse 4, we hear a prayer. They pray, Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. And the Negev did not look like the scene that you can see behind me here. The Negev was an arid, mountainous area in Judea. Most of the year, its wadis are bone dry. The psalmist's prayer is that God would restore his people's fortunes. That this time of dryness and withering and drought would be ended by heavy, refreshing rains, by flash floods that would fill the stream beds with life-giving water. Then the psalmist recognises that despite hard times, God would restore his people's fortunes. He goes on, those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. We can't be 100% sure that the calf will arrive unscathed or that the crop will grow well. But as people of faith, we can live with joy, cheerfulness, 
gladness in our hearts now, even as we sow and toil in tears in these tough times, because we know that God has always restored his people in the past and that he will do it again. God knows how to bring joy out of pain in a way that the world doesn't. He crowns our toil with blessing. This is a promise. God always delivers his people from the darkness. And nowhere is this seen more clearly than in the death and resurrection of Jesus himself. When Jesus died and went to the tomb, his father didn't allow the grave hold him. He didn't allow him to decay, but he delivered him, restored him to new life. And because of that restoration, when we were toiling in our sins, God didn't allow those sins destroy us and separate us from him forever. Rather, through faith in the risen Christ, he's given us the opportunity to be delivered from sin and death forever. The thought of the perfect joy we are guaranteed to experience in heaven should fill us with joy today and every day as we live stuck in the middle with each other. It should inspire us to tell everybody about God's restoration. You see, nothing can take away our joy when our joy is Christ himself. When we trust him completely, we can have joy because we know that even if the whole of creation were to disintegrate tomorrow, even then the Lord would deliver and restore his people. As one author puts it, one day all God's mercies, all his blessings will flow like rivers into one great beautiful sea. And the believer will stand on the shore rejoicing in awe of all that God has done. So our present gladness and joy is built upon a knowledge of God's delivery in the past and a faith of his promise to do it again in the future. That joy, that gladness, that cheerfulness and confidence in God, that's infectious, isn't it? It lifts the hearts of others and points them to God, their restorer too. Have you ever met a Christian that's full of cheer, full of joy even in hard times? It really does lift the heart. So we who know that God always delivers should be praying for God to restore our fortunes today. We should be praying for healing in our land. We should be praying for relief for those who are suffering from anxiety or confusion, disappointment, despair. We should be praying for the restoration of livelihoods, relationships. But more than that, we should be praying that those who are suffering from a spiritual dryness that has been exposed in society by these trying circumstances will be flooded with the life-giving, thirst-quenching power of the Holy Spirit. For our part, we sow and labour for the Lord maybe with tears and weeping. We can look back to a time, can't we, when our churches were full, confident that they may be full again. We should pray for our friends and family members, our work and school colleagues, our neighbours, even our enemies, that, as one commentator puts it, faithful prayer and service will eventually bear fruit in their lives. So in these times of uncertainty, let's fix our eyes on Jesus so that we may radiate joy out into a struggling world with confidence that looks back to Eden, a perfect world created by a loving God and looks forward to the new creation that will come when Christ returns to restore the fortunes of his faithful people forevermore. Let us play our part now in bringing the values and reality of that new creation to bear in the lives of those around us, that they may know God's rescue and restoration today. So this harvest time, as the cows come and gather around me, let's give thanks to God 
for his provision, remembering that with God there will be a harvest. There is always a harvest and he will restore his people's fortunes. He has done great things for us and he will do them again. So let us rejoice. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in these tough and trying times, we continue to give thanks to you for your provision and we pray with confidence. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. come to a time of thanksgiving very important thing to do all the time and particularly at harvest and again you'll see the parts you need to join in on the screen in bold let us give thanks to God the God of all peoples of the earth for the color and forms of your creation and our place within it we bring our thanks good Lord your mercy endures forever for our daily food and for those whose work and skill brings your good gifts to us, we bring our thanks, good Lord. Your mercy endures forever. For the gifts and graces inspired in human minds and hearts, for insight and imagination, for the skills of research which bring healing and fulfillment to the lives of many, we bring our thanks, good Lord. Your mercy endures forever for the light and shades of the changing seasons in their variety and dependability, for new life and growth out of barrenness and decay. We bring our thanks, good Lord. Your mercy endures forever. For new hope and strength in our communities, especially in our church and among all you call to serve you, we bring our thanks, good Lord. Your mercy endures forever. For all in whose lives we see goodness, kindness, gentleness, patience and humility and all the fruit of the Spirit, we bring our thanks, good Lord. Your mercy endures forever. For the life we have been given and for all those whom you have given us to share it, we bring our thanks, good Lord. Your mercy endures forever. 
we join together in the harvest collect. Eternal God, you crown the year with your goodness and you give us the fruits of the earth in their season. Grant that we may use them to your glory for the relief of those in need and for our own well-being. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Amen. We join together in the prayer our Saviour Christ has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Before we finish, uh, over the last few weeks we've been looking at the stories of some people whose lives have been changed by God, people who've responded to God's call and gone and done wonderful things for him. Today I want to tell you a story about a guy called Stephen who really was delivered uh, by the Lord in an amazing way. This is Stephen. He is from Zimbabwe. He doesn't look happy, does he? Stephen doesn't come from a happy family. When he was only three years old, his mum ran away and Stephen was left all alone with his little brother and sister. For a time he had to sleep in a chicken coop. Then he slept under a bridge. He fed himself by looking for leftover food in dustbins. When he got bigger, Stephen joined a street gang. They stole things and hurt people and did lots of other bad things. He was always angry. He didn't believe there could be a God and he really hated Christians. 
One day there was a Christian meeting taking place in a tent. Stephen and his friends planned to cause chaos and panic by attacking and hurting the people at the meeting. The gang planned to bomb the tent. So Stephen went inside. But he decided he would listen for just two minutes before he gave the order to the gang to throw their bombs. But he ended up listening for much longer. Stephen heard a man on the stage talking all about God. The man talked about how God knew all the wrong things we do. Stephen knew well that he did lots of wrong things and that made him very sad. But then the man started to talk about Jesus. Stephen was amazed. Jesus had lived a long time ago, but he'd had a hard life just like Stephen. But he had also loved and healed and helped people. Then Jesus had died on a cross to forgive people for the wrong things they had done. Even people like Stephen. Stephen desperately wanted to know this Jesus. So he went to the preacher and prayed. And there and then he became a friend of Jesus. Stephen was overjoyed. All his sadness went away. He finally felt happy and peaceful on the inside. Stephen's bombs never got thrown. Stephen left the street gang behind. He got himself a Bible and he couldn't stop telling people all about Jesus. He even told the passengers on the bus. He prayed with some of them. Then a missionary came along and took Stephen under his wing, helped him clean up, got him new clothes, taught him how to read and write, and most importantly taught him all about God from the Bible. Through the missionary, God taught Stephen how to love people. He even forgave all the people who had hurt him as a child. One day, he would even forgive his mother and get to know her again, as she got to know Jesus too. Stephen met Rachel, and they got married, and had five children. Once upon a time, Stephen Longu slept under a bridge. Now he's travelled all over the world telling people his amazing story. To this day he loves nothing more than telling people about Jesus and the great love he has for everyone. Stephen had ended up in a hard and unhappy place. But when Jesus came along everything changed. The Bible says in John chapter 8 verse 36 that if the Son sets you free you will be free indeed. Jesus sets us free. What good news! I wonder do you know Jesus yet? He's always ready to make new friends. And with Jesus we are never alone because he says to his friends, I am with you always. Well, before we come to our final blessing, uh, can I say thank you for being here, uh, joining with us in worship today, and uh, take courage and be encouraged by knowing that, look back, see how God has always delivered his people and trust that he will deliver them again. These uh, tough times will pass, we'll move on to something new, uh, but God uh, is always with us no matter what happens. Um, so thank you for joining us here out in the land. These cows have been uh, creeping up ever closer to me. Uh, they're enjoying the, the fruit of the land just now. Um, they look about ready for milking. Um, so I'm going to have to hightail it and scarper before, before they expect me to bring them uh, to the milking parlour. But uh, thank you for being here. And as we go, we still ourselves before God one more time peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon us this time and forevermore. Amen.